Daniel Giral has two passions. The first is his job as a researcher at the Research for Development Institute, a situation which he considers as a marvelous opportunity to satisfy his curiosity about nature and to be paid for doing it. Two steps. His speciality is aquatic ecology. He tries to understand life processes where it all started 3,800,000,000 years ago in water, or rather in mud, the interface between the continents and the oceans. It's mud which contains all the nutrients the building blocks needed for life to appear and grow. Daniel found the most beautiful mud in the South American continent in French Guiana, in the estuary of the river which crosses the core swamp, one of the biggest wetlands on Earth. Daniel's second passion, which he shares with his wife Annie and his friends in Cayenne, is dancing. The Kaur River Swamp. Daniel takes his water samples there, but only from the river which crosses it, because the 250,000 acre swamp, running 30 miles along the seacoast, is completely inaccessible. Man has never set foot there. Thanks to the proximity of the River Amazon, this is a world of life producing mud. Amazonian mud carried by marine currents. The Atlantic Ocean deposits the mud and then scours it again all the time. The swamp is different. It was created by this mud approximately 2,000 years ago, but little by little it became landlocked in this immense bay between Core Mountain and the Atlantic Ocean. But although Daniel has already studied the Core River and the mangrove swamp, this impregnable swamp is a huge question mark. No one knows anything about life inside it. For four years, Daniel has been working all out to make his dream come true. His idea is to install a platform in the swamp, a floating laboratory for scientists. Although nobody really knows, Daniel is convinced that there is a strong probability that this zone is one of the last sanctuaries for black caimans, the largest South American caimans virtually extinct as massacred for their precious skins. The river, until recently used by the hunters, is the only way to move around inside this immense swamp. Almost all the caimans have been killed, but from time to time young, immature individuals are spotted. From a helicopter, it's impossible to see if there is deep water teeming with aquatic life under the vegetation or just wet peat. That is what Daniel wants to find out. Perhaps the platform will make it possible to clear up the mystery of how the swamp operates and find out what life forms develop inside it. The project is big. In the beginning, the fight was purely against red tape. Jumping paperwork hurdles, very tiring but essential nevertheless. after four years of effort from his office in Cayenne in front of his computer, after filling in dozens of different application forms, after writing to everyone in the world, it seemed, to obtain financing and persuade Nature Conservancy associations that knowledge is the basic tool in conservation, the platform project was completely bogged down in red tape. Disappointed, completely discouraged, Daniel was ready to give up, but finally found the funds to finance the platform. Actually, making the platform frightened me. I had to force myself to finish it because all of a sudden I saw the risks everyone was going to take. And then, success. We finally set foot in an exceptionally rich habitat where no one had ever been before and of which we had only suspected the existence.
the day before transporting the platform, Daniel was very worried. But he could not reveal his fears and doubts to his partners and even less to Annie, his wife. Everything is now feasible, everything has been rigorously planned, but Daniel is fully aware of all the dangers this adventure involves. He's as scared of adult caimans as of being totally cut off from the outside world. The moment when I stood on the platform was great. I left with one of my colleagues to recover it because it was in the middle. Not a mosquito for the moment. When the helicopter left, Daniel and his team were completely cut off from the world. The platform is on a pond in the heart of the 264,000 acre swamp that Daniel has chosen with care. Approximately 15 kilometers from the sea and 10 kilometers from the river Kaur. It's noon. The temperature is about 35 degrees Celsius. The humidity from evaporation is maximum. The air is difficult to breathe. The swamp seems to be sleeping. Daniel and his team are a little disappointed as they have not yet seen a caiman. They're beginning to think that they're wrong and there are none left. The water is very black. No fish are visible, just some birds, jacanas, which seem to walk on the water. And hoadzins, prehistoric creatures which eat tree leaves, which they digest like ruminants. <laughs> The first bird to fly over the platform at close range is the largest Amazonian heron, the kokoi. It's extremely rare and seems to live in the palm trees which border the pond. The first priority for the team is to build a shelter from the rain, which falls even during the dry season. The first thing to do is to set up a water level recorder. It'll be connected to a weather station we shall install on the Carbe, the local name for a hut. We chose this period to install the water level recorder because it is the end of the dry season and the water level is theoretically at its lowest. This means that if there's water now, there will always be water here the rest of the year.
puesto. The weather station on the roof of the platform is powered by solar panels. An electronic memory in a watertight box will record all the data, day after day, which will be recovered during our next visit. With these data, and those from the water level recorder, Daniel will be able to answer the first question, does the pond flow into the river, or does the river fill the pond? Does the water contain living creatures like plankton and do the fish and the caimans interact? Can the pond repopulate the zones impoverished by uncontrolled fishing or does it operate in a closed circuit? The water which feeds the swamp either runs down from the mountain of Ko and therefore contains unusable and even toxic organic compounds or is rainwater containing no nutritive elements at all. Moreover, the slow decomposition of the swamp's floating vegetable cover consumes oxygen, significantly reducing the quantities dissolved in the water. These chemical reactions primarily release carbon dioxide in the form of bubbles. This type of environment does not seem very favorable for supporting life. This argues against the high density of fish and consequently of fish-eating birds and caimans. In fact, caimans, the ultimate predators, are very good indicators of the biological richness of the habitat. So, as a top priority, Daniel asked veterinarian Benoit de Toisy, a herpetologist, to join him on the platform. Benoit, who has spent several years studying the Core River caiman populations, jumped at the chance. This is a quick reconnaissance before nightfall. Then we shall count all the caimans in the zone and estimate their sizes. Let's go over there. There's one just ahead. Given the size of the animal's head, it must be at least five meters long. This is the first time we've seen big individuals by day. They do not flee and we're only three meters away. We can try to get closer, but it's not usual to see these animals in daylight. Let's bail a little. The boat's leaking. It was slung under the helicopter in a net, and the ride didn't do it a lot of good. So as not to count the same caimans twice, Benoit used his GPS to divide this large pond, about a mile in diameter, into parallel 20-meter-wide strips. In the boat, he patrols each of these strips to avoid observing the same part of the pond more than once. Look, it's huge. There's a big one on the right facing us. Daniel thinks the counting procedure is inaccurate, but Benoit appears quite sure of his technique. At night, the hunting caimans are almost motionless, which helps. As soon as the night is black, the screams from the howling monkey colonies echo from the Coe Mountain forest just a few miles away. These scary noises do not reassure Daniel and his team, who are spending their first night on the pond. Caimans can only be counted in a reliable way at night. In the darkness, the pupils of their eyes are completely dilated and the torches light up their retinas which reflect two red dots, the color of the blood irrigating the fundus. The animal's size can be estimated from the spacing between the red dots. Well, at least we got the size, 200. Emmerich, let's go to those two red dots over there. 
vient d'où là Là-bas, on se lance. We haven't done those yet. On arrive là. On arrive derrière là. We came from over there. We finished here, so now let's go over there. From the first night, it was obvious that this pond is a completely protected habitat for the black caimans. Benoit and his team count over a hundred specimens, some over five meters long. Daniel is overjoyed about this discovery. Benoit did not believe it possible. He was convinced that he would only find small specimens in this pond in the heart of the swamp, like the rare caiman still visible on the river Co. Despite his doubts, Daniel has been proven right. In fact, his major discovery has revealed that this pond and the whole swamp is one of the last sanctuaries for black caimans. Taking samples, not counting. We finished counting. Now we're going to try to capture 10 or 15 specimens to mark them by cutting off scales to identify them. The rain stopped and the stars are out. Let's get those three on the left. Let's go. 70, 80, 100. Too late. Too many. Gone. I caught it too low down. Just under the belly. Okay, Emmerich, have you got a firm grip? Shall I let go? No, he's only got it with one hand. That's a black caiman. You can tell by the bony ridge between the eyes, which is the same as the spectacled caiman. The difference is the coloring. The belly is white, the back is black, and the tail is black with white stripes. High contrasts. That's where we remove the scales, okay? Benoit removes a scale from the tail of each captured caiman and a drop of blood which will be analyzed in the laboratory. The results will enable him to estimate the genetic variability to determine this population's degree of consanguinity. He also hopes to find out if the caiman move between the pond, the Co River, and other parts of the swamp, and get a reliable count of the caiman population currently estimated to be approximately 2,000. Hey, look out! That was close. Hey, they charged us. Let's go. It's the children. Let's move over there. The group is tense. Nobody expected the Caymans to attack. For Benoit, this is the first time it's happened on his many expeditions. The team are going to have to be much more careful, and no one wants to get into the water. Something to remember. Are they asleep in there? You missed the excitement, we're not going back. The discovery of this extraordinary concentration of black Caymans confronts Daniel with an enigma. What do they eat? How can there be so many when logic and the first observation seem to show that there is no food in the pool? Apparently, there are few prey in the swamp either. No fish are visible to the naked eye, and the water is very black and covered with floating vegetation, which limits the penetration of light into the water, restricting the productivity of the aquatic environment. The few birds in this zone move too fast for the slow-moving reptiles. Even though caiman do not waste energy, moving their tails once an hour and spending most of their time floating semi-submerged, they must eat something sometimes. Around two o'clock in the morning, Benoit observes some very strange behavior. 
prudently, he manages to take a photo of a small caiman in the jaws of an enormous specimen. Is this to protect the baby or cannibalism? What time did you come back? I didn't hear you. Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Hello? Yes, it was raining, so we stopped. How many did you catch? Well, 13. Do you want a dry T-shirt, Alan? No, I'll drip dry. Daniel is thinking hard. This idea of cannibalism doesn't make sense as no population could survive long-term in such a limited space by feeding on itself. He has to solve this enthralling enigma. We're off. The solution is certainly hidden in the water and in the infinitely small, and that is Daniel's speciality. The caimans are one end of the food chain, but the chain starts with plankton essential to life, and he has to locate them. We're going to filter the surface water to catch the algae, and the zooplankton and the tiny shellfish. We use two different sized nets. One will catch specimens bigger than 150 micrometers in size, and the outer net will catch organisms between 150 and 40. So lower it to the bottom, and check it's not getting clogged with mud. The plankton collected in these nets is what fish eat, the starting point in the biological chain. In Coe's swamp, Given the density of vegetation, the aquatic systems must primarily be based on algae. The vegetation covering the water is very thick, so the food sources must be produced by the floating plants. This is a world first. Daniel does not understand. The swamp water appears to be foodless. There are no algae. The first step in the generation of zooplankton and the water is clear. But there are thousands of insects. He will have to wait for the answer from his laboratory in Cayenne. At the end of the first mission, Daniel has just one idea in mind, to analyze the water in his cans. He hurries to the laboratory. Now he's proved the caiman exist, but what do they eat? Daniel has to address the problem of the apparent lack of food in the pond. He will only accept the notion of cannibalism if he fails to prove there is nothing else in the water. After five hours' work, the assays prove beyond doubt that there are no phytoplankton, vegetable plankton, in the water. The water Daniel has brought back is almost pure, rainwater. The mystery remains. In all his career in research, Daniel has never met a paradox like this. 100 caimans and no food supply. On the other hand, an unexpected discovery gives him a clue, although for the moment Daniel does not yet know that it will solve the enigma. Some of his samples contain high densities of rotifers, a species of zooplankton which eats phytoplankton and constitutes the next link in the food chain. Do these living organisms eat all the vegetable plankton in the water? As rotifers are very small, they could be the ideal prey for fish fry. Logically, and as nature is usually logical, there must be fish in the pond. Daniel and Annie resume their exotically pleasant life in Cayenne. But Daniel cannot stop thinking about his unsolved problem. For scientists, there is nothing more irritating than not knowing. Thanks. Mm. 
Hmm. Oh, c'est divisant, ça. That's pretty good looking. Bon, that's good. C'est quand même plus confortable. It's much more comfortable. Donc, double masque, The double mask hides your skin. Donne plus voir la peau. Alors, qu'est-ce que ça donne, ça Si je peux garder les lunettes, non Guyana lives to the beat of the carnival. Daniel knows that nobody will go to the swamp with him during this period, and in any case, Annie and he really enjoy the festival. The solution to the enigma of core will have to wait. People use masks to cover every square inch of their skins so that in the carnival they could do things that were never usually permitted. Like contacts between whites and blacks. Personne ne pouvait faire, c'est-à-dire des contacts entre blancs et noirs. With the carnival in full swing, Annie gets a phone call. The adventure starts again. Daniel has never stopped thinking that the rotifers in his samples could be the food for fish fry, and that fish could be the link between plankton and caimans. He's very happy that Professor Francois Meunier, director of the ichthyology laboratory at the Paris Natural History Museum, wants to come to the platform to study the pond fish. Francois and his colleague Philip Keith have already made an inventory of the fish in the Core River. They've also studied the growth of astonishing species adapted to oxygen poor habitats. Both are very curious to find out what lies under the water. Perhaps Daniel will finally discover if this pond is full of fish for the caimans or a biological desert. But conditions are now radically different. This is the rainy season. The swamp water has risen a full meter. Good trip? Well, we were delayed by the fog, and it was difficult to find the site, so we preferred to wait. Okay, well, you're there now. Laying the nets won't be a problem. There's a caiman there to the right. We'll go to the furthest pond. As they paddle out, they see something new. This time, there are more white tufted herons. Apparently, this is the mating season, as they have the long courtship feathers. They have already built their nests. This new phenomenon complicates Daniel's problem. What do they eat? It must be fish, but what species? And where from? His first assumption is that these birds do not feed inside the swamp. This is because the floating vegetation prevents the normal way these birds fish. Usually they dive on prey they can see. Laying the nets is a problem because the thick floating vegetation prevents their installation across the stream between the ponds. And nobody feels like getting out of the boat to attach them to the vegetation. Well, we fixed the net. We'll leave it in place until tomorrow morning, about 12 hours.
I didn't sleep much. We were attacked at about three o'clock. Well, the platform weighs about 800 kilos, and there are eight of us on board. Despite the weight, the platform moved. The prudent thing to do is to set up a fence. Perhaps it won't stop an attack, but it will slow down the first assault, so we can work out what to do. We try to be sensible, but the situation is getting a little fraught. The animals are friendly, but big. The floats have gone. The caimans attack the nets. Look, there are two big ones. Are they trapped? The floats are underwater. Is there a caiman inside? I think it's caught on something. It's teeth. Watch out, he's stronger than you. If you trap your fingers in the net, he'll pull you to the bottom. The caiman have chewed the fish to pieces. Even the head is hanging off. Do you recognize the species? It's a patagai, a predator. Well, at least we know what they eat. Fish. The patagai's stomach is full. Let's open it to find out what it's been eating. Fish. Look, there's a fish tail. There's not much left. Just a little brown skin with black spots. So that must be an oyak. So the patagai ate an oyak and then was attacked by a caiman. Patagais are voracious predators. They snap up their prey with their teeth, which look just like the teeth of the caimans which eat them. Despite the state of the five nets, almost all unusable after a single night, part of the Coast Swamp Enigma has been resolved. Caimans are not cannibals. They eat fish, dead or alive. The anatomy of a caiman's mouth is ideal for underwater hunting. Due to folds of skin closing the trachea, caimans can stay underwater with their jaws open without their lungs filling up with water. Their eyes have an astonishing mobile optical membrane called the nictitant membrane, which automatically flips into position in front of the cornea when the reptile dives. Caimans can see as well underwater as on land. A metinis, a patagai, a powerful predator in the fish chain. And I think that it eats another predator we caught in the net, a don de chien. Probably the food the caimans eat. Look, the don de chien has teeth too. What a tiny predator. Small but effective and very well equipped for hunting. They're very streamlined. Metinis are herbivorous piranha, and this one is very typical because it is extremely flat. 
Those small, slightly darker spots are very common in carnivorous and herbivorous piranhas. So this is net 5. We recovered it yesterday from pond 2. During this mission, François and Philippe caught 19 different species of fish in significant quantities. It now seems certain that there are enough large fish to feed the caimans. The biggest predator in this pond, apart from the caimans, is the patagai, which can grow to 40 centimeters in length. There is nothing bigger. That's when the caimans start to get interested. The reptile's food depends on the life in the pond. But where do the nutritive salts essential for the food chain to start to generate this very high final density come from? Daniel's new samples still do not give him a logical explanation. The first link in the chain remains a mystery. third day of the ichthyology mission, the scientists get a surprise. Daniel does not yet know that it is the key to the swamp mystery. Moving through the flooded forest, the boat disturbs a big bird sitting on a shrub. No one on the team has seen the species of highly colored heron before. It has a remarkable sword-like beak. Daniel spots a flight of 10 birds. They are ponderously carrying branches from one side of the pond to the other. Back in Cayenne, Daniel contacts Olivier Tostin, the specialist in the birds of Guyana. From Daniel's description, he decides that what they have seen are probably agami herons. During his long career in Guyana, Olivier has only seen this forest heron two or three times. It is very rare and has never been studied. He accepts with alacrity Daniel's suggestion to join the next mission to make the first field study of these birds. The third mission on the platform at the end of March addressed Pond Avifauna. I think this is the right direction. That's where the agami herons settled with branches in their beaks. If they are nesting here, we should find them in this marshy forest. The scientists are in for a big surprise. Daniel is looking at the key to the enigma of the swamp. There were very few birds here in December when the platform was positioned. Now Daniel and Olivier are deafened by the bird calls. Hundreds and hundreds of agami herons are nesting everywhere in the flooded forests around the pond and which extend far into the swamp. In almost all the nests, there are young chicks waiting for food. Olivier Tostin cannot believe his eyes. This is the first time anyone has ever seen this sight. Up until now, the biggest agami heron colony ever documented was 12 nests in Costa Rica. Olivier counts nearly a thousand. Has anyone ever found this heron's breeding grounds in Guyana before? Never. Really never. This is really new, and apparently there are hundreds of them here. Amazing, truly exceptional. Mm -hmm. 
But Daniel and Olivier are in for even more surprises. Exploring the flooded forests, they discover flocks of Savicus herons. These are ecological rarities too. Very few people have seen them and very little is known about them. They nest in the same trees as the agami herons and the two species seem to get on very well together. This pond is a unique and completely protected nursery. The prospects for research on these birds are enthralling. Nothing is known about their behavior or even their diet. Even here they stay hidden. They prefer the zones where we hardly ever go. That nest got eggs in it. Are they blue? The nest is very simple, just a pile of branches. A little more structured, a little bigger, but just dead branches. These nests are only used once. They only need to survive until the chicks are big enough to cling onto the nest's peripheral branches. Then the nest disappears. Ah, look at that. The birds are fighting. With their beaks. The feathers of the crest are absolutely amazing. Very pretty indeed. Do they keep them? Look, there's a Whitson behind. He left a nest. Let's see what's under those bushes. And there? That's a cockroy. Look, there's a night heron's nest with two chicks still inside. And there are agami herons everywhere. A huge heronry. This is an incredible discovery. There are scores of thickets like that one. We'll make a close account, but there are literally hundreds of couples. This is obviously a breeding zone. That's why they come. The birds must fly here from where they feed in the thickets on the core plain. But how far away? Another mystery. First things first, the habitat. Two eggs. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have to find out why the agami herons feel the need to flock together. They must be seeking protection from predators. But they nest in low branches, so the predators can't live on the land or in the trees. That would be catastrophic. So you think the caimans protect the herons? I'm not sure if we can say that now, but it certainly seems so. Some clues indicate that the caimans stop the other predators. The animals which live in the forest and the hills would find it difficult to get to this part of the forest from over there. Olivier is fascinated by the birds, but Daniel's gaze never leaves the foliage of the trees and suddenly understanding dawns. The nutritive salts essential to starting the food chain come from the droppings of the thousands of birds that nest here during the rainy season.
During the period of very high rainfall, the nutritive contributions from the bird droppings are at their maximum. But the climatic conditions and lack of light prevent the algae from using them. The arrival of the dry season and the light permit the plankton chain to get underway. The plankton which was vegetating at the bottom of the swamp due to the lack of nutritive elements rises to the surface and proliferates. While studying the behavior of agami herons during the mission, Olivier and Daniel note that the birds remain on the nest all day long to consolidate it and rest. They never see them fishing in the swamp. Observations with infrared lighting confirm that their activity is primarily nocturnal. Every night, in turn, one of the two adults sleeps on a branch so as not to disturb the chicks, while the other leaves the pond and returns, completely exhausted after several hours of flight and fishing, and feeds the chicks by regurgitation. And that is the final key to the enigma. The swamp effectively functions in a closed circuit, but with one essential exception. The thousands of birds seek their food outside the swamp, perhaps as far as 60 miles away, until their chicks can fend for themselves. But their droppings remain in the swamp and fertilize the pond water. This is enough for life to explode. The food chain can start because the essential nutrients are available. By solar photosynthesis, the phytoplankton produce organic matter, the zooplankton eaten by the fish fry. Once adult, these fish become the food for larger carnivorous fish, which in turn are eaten by the caimans. Without the birds, there would be no plankton, no fish, and no black caimans. In an extraordinary way, the caimans help the birds by protecting them from predators. They keep tree-dwelling animals like monkeys out of the swamp. By choosing a zone completely surrounded by water, the birds can nest in peace. Daniel has pierced the mystery of the very original way the whole of the ecosystem of this pond operates, and undoubtedly the entire swamp. Now we have an insight into the link between the production of algae, fish, birds and caimans. It is essential to protect the zone's dormitory function for these birds. They enable the explosion of life we have now observed. This was completely unsuspected as the water samples we took in the rainy season were not life-sustaining. This was a complex jigsaw puzzle to put together. What makes this puzzle interesting is that the parts of my puzzle are put together by different people. They help me work out the patterns and shapes. It was very exciting, just like a game. There are small clues and you have to build a logical construct from a host of different data. And you know in advance that there may be another interpretation. It would be sad if science were immutable.